Chicago. It's, it's sort of afternoon for me, so if I fall asleep uh, during this, don't worry. Um, I, years ago, I met the, uh, the great Carl Sagan when he was over in England. I, if any of you heard him speak live, I know some of you are probably too young for that, but he was a fantastic speaker, fantastic live. And uh, so I took the opportunity, I was quite young then, I said, Mr. Sagan, I, I think I admire your work, a fantastic sign, but you're brilliant at speaking. Can you give me some tips so that if I'm speaking live, I, I know what to do? And he said, well, it's just one thing you need to remember. So I, I got a book out, ready to write it down. Um, and he said, when, when you're speaking live, the one thing to remember is don't pee yourself. And <laughs> it's, it's something I've always remembered. I'm going to try hard today. Um, if any of you spot any, you know, anyway, there we go. I'm going to try. Um, right, cyborgs. Um, how many of you here would like to be a cyborg? Hey, it is good. Good. Chicago's up for it. Brilliant. Excellent. Well done. I love it. I love it. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, some, the type of cyborgs, because some people think you're a cyborg if you use a bicycle or you have uh, glasses or something. Uh, fine. I'm not going to argue about that. But I'm looking at cyborgs where you have technology that's integral, that's part of you, and also it enhances you. It gives you extra abilities. So that's the type of cyborg, the enhanced with integral technology uh, that I'm going to be looking at here. And it's really, really trying to say, well, if you want to be a cyborg, what sort of thing can you do? What can you get on with? Some of you wanted to do it. Right. This is the sort of opportunity. Because there's different types of cyborgs. So Let's have a look. This is, this is the real me. Uh, at, at, uh, this, this is a sort of an older version. This is the real me having um, a, what's called a radio frequency identification device. Some of you maybe got smart cards and things like that. It's the same sort of thing, but it was implanted. This is, I have, this is, um, it looks like it's two years ago, I would say. Uh, <laughs> May, maybe a bit longer. This was implanted in my arm, and uh, when I walked around in my building, because we had the computer recognizing me, so it knew where I was, so it opened doors for me and switched on lights, and going through the front door, it said, hello, Professor Warwick, because it was quite formal. Now the computer says, hello, Kevin, and it's all fine. But so you, it was actually, the, you can see it in the forceps, Doctor, the, the, the implant was then, because it was big, big, it was, these were real implants when I was younger, um, that was about the size of a quarter, something like that. Now, of course, you can get them the size of a grain of rice for the, the wimps that have the same sort of implants now. My, one of my researchers has got one. Um, but it's the sort of thing you can do. It makes you a little bit of a cyborg, maybe, but not too much. So I'll, I'll go right up to date what some of my undergraduate students are doing for their degree. Because I get a lot of students who want to have implants, and they think I can. And this is, we get ethical approval for doing this. So I'm supposed to say, don't do this at home. But it, you actually can do this at home. It's the sort of thing. <laughs> Um, you see there, this is Jowish, uh, one, one of my students, and he's having uh, magnets implanted in his fingers. The interesting thing, I don't know whether you can see because it's quite dark, the guy who's doing it has tattoos on his arm there, and he is real, he's not really a doctor, he's a tattoo guy who does these things. And we have to get ethical approval in the university. The guy goes by the name, serious, this is serious, he goes by the name of Dr. Evil. <laughs> and you can imagine filling in these official university forms, you know, is it correct medical of a year, so procedures, and who's going to do it, Dr. Evil? Yeah. <laughs> It, it, they do question it a little bit, I have to say, but he's a good guy. So, Jowish having magnets implanted, uh, so this is something you could try. It, just a, a close-up of the, this is a, an x-ray of the magnets in his fingers, I've got two magnets. And I've got three students now that have magnets. They actually go, when they're going out for a drink at night, they try it in the pub. They say, hey, look, I can, when I have this drink, I can lift up pieces of metal. And, uh, it, it's, uh, I have no idea. What we do, with a magnet, a coil of wire around the magnet, linked to something like a sonar, an ultrasonic sensor. So if something comes closer, the sonar sensor will stimulate the electrical current in the, the coil, which will vibrate the magnet. 
if something's closer, it vibrates the magnet more. Something further away, it might vibrates the magnet less. So the student can feel how far away an object is. Point, point to it and point, ah, and if it comes closer or further away. Um, I have a student now who's working with an infrared sensor rather than a sonar sensor. So what he can do is point and feel how hot an object is a distance away. Isn't that, it's cool, isn't it, really? Uh, I mean, so it's changing a sense, in this sense, a sense of remote heat into a feel in, inside the body. So it's this sort of thing, lots of potential applications, if you can imagine in the military domain, soldiers having these implanted. So before they go into a room, if they're trying to find out if there's anybody in the room, they can just put their finger around the corner and so just, <laughs> ah, yeah, somebody there. So, oh, I shouldn't say that, immediate applications, anyway. Let's have a look at different type. Maybe that doesn't appeal to you, having magnets implanted. That maybe this will. Um, this is a completely different type of cyborg. Um, robot body. This is very, if anybody's into Kafka, this is very Kafka-esque. I just love saying that word. So this is Kafka-esque. There's the robot body, nicely with little wheels so it doesn't fall over. Technical word, it's statically stable. It doesn't fall over. So it's not had any alcohol or anything like that. The, the brain of the robot is a biological neural network. So the robot does not have a computer for a brain. It's not a human controlling it like that. It, it has a biological brain. MEA is multi-electrode array. So it's actually a little dish with electrodes on the bottom of it. We take brain cells from rat embryos separate them using enzymes, lay them in this dish, feed them using very similar to an athletics drink. It's got minerals and nutrients, except it costs an awful lot more in this laboratory bottle. And we feed it, and it, it grows. The neurons grow, connect together. After about one week, we have a two-dimensional brain which we connect to the robot body. So what I'm going to show now is a little clip. This is the robot. And this, so this, the only decision making that happens with this robot is with a biological brain. Here we go. <clears throat> and what it's supposed to do is this. Oh, there we go. So it detects the wall and turns, and then it changes its mind, and then it sort of crashes into the wall. <laughs> Because this is, a, this is a baby robot. This is like two weeks old. And if I show you the same robot with the brain developing, because the brain develops and it learns habitually. It's called Hebbian learning. But every day it's in the corral and it does this. And it's the sort of thing when you do something and you do something and you do something and you, oh, it's become automatic. I'm not thinking about it. Well, in a way, you're not thinking about it. The neural pathways have strengthened so much that you stimulate it in some way and you do something without thinking about it. That's what happens with this brain. But we can see that development under the microscope. We now also have human neurons. We, we just buy them, actually from an American company. We buy them, a bit like Amazon, human neurons, yes, I have some of those. And, and they're delivered, and so we've got them to put in there. So it's the sort of thing that if you wanted to become a cyborg and you have a few spare neurons, just sort of hand them in, and next day part of you could be moving around in a robot body. Or if you have a loved one and they're about to die or something, just take a few of their neurons and you know, they will still be around in their robot body form. So there's lots of possibilities. So it's a different type of um, cyborg, but a different opportunity. So anybody that has a few, I know students, you have lots of spare neurons that you're not using, <laughs> um, particularly in the morning, I don't use any neurons at all. Um, let's, let's have a look yet another type of cyborg. Um, this is Campbell Aird, who lost his arm due to cancer, and he's been given this robot arm, but you'll see he's, he, in his left hand, he's flicking a switch to control the robot hand, which is a bit silly. Now, I know close to here, Todd Koiken at the Rehab Institute is doing some fantastic work reconnecting nerve fibers and so on, um, but still you have external connections. In this, in this case, I mean, it's great for somebody to have a replacement arm, and I'm not really going to talk about therapy today, 
but wouldn't it be better if he could control that robot hand directly from his brain? And wouldn't it be better if when the hand touches something, he can feel what the hand's feeling directly in his brain? What that needs is a bi-directional interface, connections directly from his brain, from his nervous system, to the wires, and back the other way. And great, if let's say we have an interface like that, so we can get brain signals onto wires, signals from the wires up into the brain, we can give somebody a replacement arm or a leg or whatever part of the body you like, in fact. Um, but it doesn't have to be the same size. Uh, I mean, it could be a bigger, it could be an arm that crushes a car or, or it could be a, a bigger leg or something different. But it doesn't have to be an arm or leg. It, it can be something completely different. It could be wheels, if you want. I mean, any piece of technology. And importantly, it doesn't have to be attached to the body. Because if we're getting brain signals on wires, well, we can plug into those wires. We can send the signals anywhere. You're, and now we have that, if you want to be a cyborg, we have the technology now to plug into your nervous system and send your brain signals onto another continent or somewhere completely different. So your body can be wherever you want the network to take it. Isn't that cool? So that's the technology we have now. That's not really looking to the future. That's looking what we have now. Um, and in terms of what I've done for it, this is me on the operating theatre in Oxford, uh, in the operating theatre, having an implant. There were four neurosurgeons involved. So this is looking what, what's available now. Um, this is what was implanted. You, you may find it called the brain gate system. It's also called the Utah array. 100 electrodes. Um, since this time in Providence, Rhode Island, Matt Nagel has had one implanted in his cortex. He was a, a guy that had problems due to a crash. I, I didn't have medical problems. I, I scientifically wanted to investigate what was possible. So this was implanted into the nerve fibers in my left arm, um, literally a little pneumatic hammer, bang, 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 push it into place. So I'm not necessarily saying try this one tonight, you might find slightly problematic. But the sort of things that I could do with this implanted in my arm, quite simply, it is a bit like listening into a telephone call. So if I move my hand, what I'll call neural signals, we could pick up and send into the computer to get those neural signals to do other things. But also we could send signals into my nervous system, electrical signals that my brain learned to recognize. So it was a bi-directional interface, just the sort of thing I was talking about. So let's have a look. This is a clip from Discovery, um, which shows you some of the things that I could do. And I, if I had a machine doing this instead of a human, he would have... One only... man in tune with technology is the world's first cyborg. Part man, part machine. Kevin Warwick, cybernetics professor at Reading University, England, took a leap into the future as long ago as 2002. For three months, a silicon chip was implanted into the nerves in his arm. At that time, no human had had an implant of this type before. It was a procedure that until then had only been tested on chickens. Would the body reject it? Would it affect the way I moved or, or my sensory capabilities? I, I could have lost the use of my hand. Could it affect my brain? Ultimately, could have sent me crazy. Kevin was plugged into a computer which monitored the nerve signals from his brain to his arm receiving and transmitting them as radio waves. With the signals from his brain, Kevin could not only turn on lights, he could control a wheelchair. And from 5,000 kilometers away via the internet, he succeeded in getting a robot hand to mimic his own hand movements. His most impressive experiment involved his wife, Irena, also having a chip implanted in her arm. The communication experiment between myself and Irena was vitally important to me. This was the highlight of the whole experiment. Kevin wanted to discover if it was possible for his brain to receive and feel signals from Irena's brain. When Irena first moved her hand, it actually felt like a charge running up 
my index finger. It was a phenomenal feeling. Literally, every time she moved, my brain received a signal. There we were communicating for the first time in the world, nervous system to nervous system. It was the first time two people had electronically communicated by thought alone. In the short term, we're going to see implants used to help people who are paralysed switch on lights, operate the TV, just by thinking about it. In 30 years, he believes we'll all have chips in our brains. But ultimately, having extra memory, having downloads from the computer, uploading from the brain. Earth is going to be controlled by cyborgs. Humans are going to be something of a subspecies. We'll be half man, half machine, with super memory, super senses and superpowers. I think quite clearly that's where we're going, superhuman. Isn't it obvious? I mean, oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Who would want to be a human with a future like that? Just, just to pick up on one of those things that we talked about. I mean, one of the things I did was to go to Columbia University where we plugged my nervous system live into the internet and I was able to control a robot hand back in the UK in England where I'm from, but also feel when the hand was gripping an object. Remember, that's on a different continent. So extending the body is all possible if that's what you want to do. But the key thing for me when we're looking to the future is communication. And we've heard that communicating with the future. When you think how we communicate as humans and you compare it to how technology communicates, human communication is pathetic. It's absolutely terrible. I mean, when you think we have highly complex electrochemical signals in our brains, our thoughts, images, emotions, colors, and if we want to communicate those with somebody else, what do we do? We convert them to mechanical pressure waves. This is sound, it's slow, it's error prone. Eventually it gets to somebody else, a coded message, serial. Can you believe we still communicate in serial? And somebody's ears will convert the mechanical signals back to electrochemical signals. And even if you've been married for 40, 50 years, still have no idea what it is your husband tried to tell you. Why can't we just send signals directly from brain to brain in parallel, like computers do? Colors, images, emotions, ideas. If somebody says no, you'll know what they mean then. You won't need to think. <laughs> and if somebody says, yeah, that was great for me, you'll know whether it was or not. <laughs> let's, let's, <laughs> and you can make it even better. Let's, let's make the future much, much closer as far as communication is concerned. This presentation, it started off the title, What Technology Do We Need? Where are we still? I don't know. I think we have the technology. The last remaining issue, the last remaining hurdle is you. you if you don't want to do it, if you're scared or something like that, then okay. I know it, there's a film, Back to the Future, I guess, some of you, and Marty in that. You know, don't, if anybody goads him and said he's yellow or he's chicken, he has to have a go and do it. So be like Marty. Have a go. Go for it yourself. Become a cyborg and experience what it's like to be part of the future. Thank you very much.